نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بل بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ وقال عز وجل إن أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأخذة من لساني يفكر قوي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وفتن قباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وفتن اجتنابا أمين Today my lecture will be very important So I will be saying things that some of you will find interesting inshallah But just to review before I move forward I have been saying for the past few weeks and different times that this program of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, the focus of this program is Qur'an. Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month in which we reveal Qur'an. Then in order to avail from this, the benefit of Qur'an, in order to have the benefit of Qur'an, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us fast. Why? Because the result of fasting is taqwa. And the taqwa is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you people who believe fasting has been ordained for you like it was ordained for the people before you, so you will have taqwa. Taqwa is the ability to have willpower to stop yourself or to be able to do what you need to do to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So taqwa is the willpower to do something. And I'll be talking about willpower in, in, uh, towards the end of the khutbah today. But this willpower is what you need, this taqwa and the fear of Allah with this. So the willpower on the other one side and the fear of Allah. Some God consciousness, some awareness, self-awareness of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you have these two things together, the awareness or the mindfulness that Allah is there and He's watching you, and your ability to stop yourself or to be able to do what Allah wants, this is taqwa. This is why whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most of the times in the Qur'an, whenever Allah gives a command, Allah says, ittaqillah. You know the dua, the ayat we use for marriage? Also, taqwa, taqwa, taqwa. Why? Because you're going to take on a responsibility. You should be aware that Allah is watching you. And also, you should have the ability to have the willpower to do what is right. When this willpower has been developed, then Allah says, okay, now read Qur'an. When you will read Qur'an and build a relationship with Qur'an, then obviously your life has to transform, has to change. To adopt to the will of the Qur'an or the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will adapt to the will of the do's and the don'ts that are given in the Qur'an. So this is one aspect of Ramadan that I have talked about in some detail. And I have just summarized this. Now from this point, that I hope everybody here has now ingrained this in their minds. Now today I'm going to take this further. I'm going to mention this point in the beginning and I'm going to mention this point in the end. <coughs> and that is that on the one side Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fi il Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month in which we have revealed Qur'an. And in the end of this month is Laylatul Qadr. Why? Why? You know, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, and this part of Qur'an is sometimes misunderstood, and I'm going to clarify this. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that are in many numbers, is the pen. The first thing, when there was nothing, the first thing Allah created was the pen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the pen to write. Now you'll say, why am I talking about this? 
it will become clear. And the pen wrote everything that was to be written. Everything that will happen from the beginning of creation to the end of creation, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And this tablet on which all everything was written, this tablet is called Lawh al Mahfud, the preserved tablet. Now you'll be surprised when I tell you this. But this tablet that is the preserved tablet, which most people know about, it has a heart. It has a center. The center of this Lawh al Mahfuz is Umm al Kitab. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يُمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَحَّرُونَ So that preserved tablet, which is under the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in it is also, it includes everything, so it also includes the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means when He refers to Al-Kitab as is His knowledge. For example, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنْفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَعَ No affliction comes on earth or to any individual except it's already written in a book before it happens. إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٍ It's so easy for Allah. Everything that is written, it happens. Now I'm not going to talk about destiny and, and, and the, uh, the, the issues, the, the philosophical issues of destiny. This is not the topic today. In another place, Fir'aun said to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى Oh, you're come here to give me guidance and telling me what is truth, but what about the people before us? فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونَ الْأُولَى What about our forefathers? They didn't have this guidance. So Musa alayhi salatu wasalam answered, إِلْمُهَا إِنْدَ اللَّهِ فِي الْكِتَابِ The knowledge of it is with Allah in the book. يَعْنِي in the Allah has written everything and everything in لَوْبِ الْمَحْفُونِ لا يضل ربي ولا ينسى. My Allah doesn't forget anything. He doesn't make any mistakes. This is all in the preserved Quran. Then I read the ayah to you. إنه لا قرآن كريم إن بل هو قر بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ. This Quran is also. But Allah says, but no. This is in a preserved tablet. This Quran is also in a preserved tablet. في لوح محفوظ. So your destinies which come down on Laylatul Qadr are Lahul Mahfuz. And the Quran which comes down or which has come down to Prophet Muhammad is also in Lahul Mahfuz. What is the relationship between the Quran coming down from Lahul Mahfuz and your destinies that are written for you coming down in Lahul Mahfuz? Allah gives you one month. Why the heart is the Quran of this Lahul Mahfuz? Umm al-Kitab ladayna is what Quran calls it. It's the mother book. In this tablet, there are many books. Every person is a book. Every creation is like a book. And its nature and its destiny and what will happen. It's a book in this law al-Mahfuz. Like a book, you know, there are many surahs. Every surah is like a book. Quran, when Allah himself says al-Kitab, many times Allah refers to the surah, not to the whole book. So, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the beginning of Surah Al-Qadr is about the Qur'an. The last two verses are about your destiny. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ Indeed, I, Allah, we have revealed this Qur'an on Laylatul Qadr. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ And how can you know, how can you possibly know what is the significance of this Laylatul Qadr? إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَحْرٍ It's better than a thousand months. But then the subject changes to your destinies. Why? I'll answer this in a second. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوْهُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ And then on that night every year, the angels, they come down with your destinies that are ordained for you. For all the matters. The angels, they come down with all the matters that are going to be done that year until the next Laylatul Qadr. From Lahul Mahfud, the angels get their information. The same way Jibreel والسلام, he was bringing down information from the tablets. <coughs> okay, having said this, so why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
Shahul Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah revealed the Qur'an. And then, at the end of this is Laylatul Qadr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a month. This Qur'an is the Ummul Kitab, it's the heart. Your destinies will be decided based upon your attitude towards the Book of Allah. Listen to what I'm saying. That destiny that is written for you, the Qur'an is the mirror, the, ju the judge, the, the balance. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ This Qur'an is the mizan by which your destinies will be judged. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَفْعَوْ بِهَذِهِ أَقْوَامًا وَيَدْعُوا بِهِ آخَرِينَ The Prophet ﷺ said, nations will rise because of this Qur'an. This Qur'an is the criteria by which we either go up or we go down. I've mentioned this more than once. Whenever Muslims were close to Qur'an, Whenever they held on to Qur'an, they went up. Whenever they left Qur'an, this is our history, like Mubayyana, clear history, which you can read our history and see as our relationship was, was, with, was to Islam, whether we were a few in number, and if we, our relationship with Qur'an was good, we went up. If we were many in number and our relationship with Qur'an was bad, we went down. Your destinies will be decided based upon the mirror of how you acted according to the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْدِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Do you accept a part of my book? أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْدِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Do you accept a part of my book? My part of my laws? Part of my sharia? وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Then you reject the other parts. فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْأَلُ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا خِزْيُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Then what will be the reward of that attitude? If you take this attitude with my book, then I will have no reward for you. You will be humiliated in this life. You can have the most educated people. You can have all the oil and the resources under your feet. You can have the most PhDs. But if your attitude towards Quran is not correct, the divine law is, the divine right is, that you will be humiliated. And then in the Day of Judgment, you were humiliated in this life and you will be humiliated in the next life. For people like the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, they were respected in this life and they will be respected in the next life. Now, so, there are three aspects of Qur'an that Qur'an emphasizes in this month. Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an Number one, hudhan lil nas. Number two, وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَىٰ Number three, Furqan. What are those? Because now, Laylatul Qadr is, has either come or is coming. And you're going to be judged based upon your attitude, collectively and individually. Based upon your attitude towards the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, number one, what should you have gained now at the end? Allah revealed this Qur'an to humanity, so the destinies change. Like Iqbal said, Bote Mu'azzaz Musalmaahu Kartum Huay Khar Tariq Al-Qur'an They, Iqbal says in English, they Muslims, they were respected being Muslims. You all Muslims now have been disrespected, humiliated, downtrodden because you have left the Qur'an. Your destiny is, Inna Allah la yugayru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah doesn't change your people until they decide to change themselves. So, our attitude, now you are coming to the end, you have to ask yourself, what is, has Qur'an transformed me? Has Qur'an inspired me? Has Qur'an motivated me? Do I even believe that this is the book of Allah? Have I even read the translation, just a mere translation, from the beginning of the book to the end? If you haven't been inspired by the book of Allah, it's amazing to me, actually, that somebody believes something is the book of Allah and has not been inspired by it. It's so amazing that how that can happen. So, try now in the last few days to be inspired. Read the book of Allah. Build a relationship with Allah. Build a relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
because this is the book that if it inspires you, destinies will be changed. Allah brought down the Quran to change destinies. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. We revealed this Quran on the night of Qadr. This is the night of Qadr where things can change. So, let me now go to the next point <coughs> that I wanted to do, which is I wanted to go over. I have actually three subjects that I want to touch. Number one, since we are now finishing the Quran, let me go over some of the major themes of Quran in a short summary. What are some of the themes of Quran? Number one, the call of Quran. What is the call of Quran? The call of Quran is, Ya ayyuhan nas, u'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wa alladhina min qablikum la'illakum. O you people who build, O you people, O mankind, all mankind, i'budu rabbakum. Become slaves to Allah. Allah wants you to become His slave fully and totally. Submit to Him. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given no promises. If you accept Islam, you're gonna have, everything will be easy for you. No. But it's the opposite. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did people think, they will not be tested. Allah will not test you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't say for the people that died in the cause of Allah, they're dead. But you don't perceive it. We're going to test you with the loss of life and wealth and loss of fruits and, 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 and your resources will go for Bashir is sabirin we Muslims, we have a lot of work to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this community. We're under divine law, you have to understand this. Nothing's going to change our situation unless we fix ourselves with Allah because no matter how much money we make, no matter how many zeros we add to the number of Muslims, no matter how many, what we do, until our attitude towards the book of it, as long as we're Muslims and we're part of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad, we're under this divine law. Look, Bani Israel, the former Muslim Ummah, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, Inni faddaltukum ala alalami. I chose you above all humanity. I chose you above all humanity. To the same people, when they turn their, their backs to Allah, Allah says, وَبُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّرْدَةُ وَالْمَسْكَنَةُ I heaped humiliation and helplessness upon them. They were strong, but they were helpless. Same thing with Muslims, we're strong, but we're helpless. Helpless. In the same way, Allah says, We have made you the best of the communities. But that best of the communities was for the companions of the Prophet for the Sahaba. But what is our attitude towards the Book of Allah? Subhanahu? So in the last few days are extremely important that we make some sort of commitment you have to make an internal commitment that yes I'm going to read the book of Allah I'm going to understand the book of Allah I mean something to inspire you you have to read Quran till it inspires you you have to read the book of Allah till you feel you're being inspired by it. wow Allah said this I'm amazed or something you read and you're like oh wow Allah says this in Quran and I know this in my medical books or I know this in my field of whatever it is Read Qur'an until you, you believe. You know we believe because why? We're born Muslim. There was a, a philosophy class in Azhar University in which some students were there and the, and the teacher was asking, why do you believe? And every teacher, every student was giving, I believe because of this. And he was giving evidences because Qur'an is this and because Islam is this. He said, no, you believe because you're Muslim. You were born Muslims. That's why you believe. But you have to raise yourself to that level that where you can go back and say, okay, if I had this knowledge, I would have become Muslim. If I would have been inspired by Quran this much, I would have become Muslim. Now, there's a little bit of time left. Let me go over five ayat of Quran. These are extremely important verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And they are long, long verses. Like for example, Ayat al We will go over Ayat al if Allah allows. Then we'll go over Ayat al-Ayat. Then we'll go over Ayatul Ikhtilaf. And I like to actually call it Ayatul Ikhtilafain because it refers to two Ikhtilafs. 
Then you have Ayatul Kursi. I will go over the gist of Ayatul Kursi. And then you have Ayatul Dain, five ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah that are extremely important, both philosophically and in guidance. So at least, maybe you didn't read the translation, you didn't read anything to inspire yourself. Maybe I will share something with you that you will feel inspired. Oh, this is the message of Quran. Number one, Ayatul Bir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Ayah 177 Surah Al-Baqarah, this is the most important ayah in the Quran in regards to ethics in Islam. You can have complete books on this in terms of the ethics of Islam. Not morals and manners. Adab you will learn from the Prophet Adab, morals and manners you will learn from books like Adab al-Mufrad, which is written by Imam Bukhari, which is a hadith book which every Muslim should have. And they should go through Adab al-Mufrad with their children where it teaches them the rights of the parents and being patient with the parents and the rights of the children also and the rights of everyone. But as far as ethics is concerned, the philosophical basis of Islamic ethics, ayah number 177 is most profound. What does Allah say? Now again, I'm running out of time, so let me just be quick. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرَةِ وَالْبَغْرِ Bir is not only that you turn your faces to the east or the west, but the basis, the philosophical basis in Islam for ethics, why you should behave this way, why you should behave in a certain manner. The basis is, وَلَكِنْ بِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ Number one, to believe in Allah. You, if you're doing good, you have to be doing good for something. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah previous to that, لِكُلِّ لِكُلِّ uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, that for everything there is a goal. I mean, you're doing good for what? So, man amana billahi, wal yawm al akhiri, and the day of judgment. There's no right and wrong if there's no day of judgment. If no one's going to take your accounting, there's no right and wrong. There's no there's no basis to have a reason of right and wrong if there's no day of judgment. So, likulli wajhadin huwa muwaliha for everything there's a goal. Fastabik wal khayrat. So first is you believe in Allah. You believe in the attributes of Allah. He's Rahim, He's Kareem. So you can have those qualities yourself like the Prophet said, وسلم, put into yourself the qualities of Allah. Then believing in the Day of Judgment. And the angels. I won't go into the angels yet, but this is a very important part of our ethics. You believe there's an angel on your right and the angel on your left, he's writing down everything you're doing. Wal malaikati. Wal kitab and the book. The law, the book of Allah, Quran, gives you the criterion of what is right and wrong. Wal nabiyyin, and they're also role models, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're also what? So this is the philosophical basis, the foundation. Then number two, na ibadah. Iba'a Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is also, this is most explained in Surah Al-Balaq, this issue. Abu Bakr had concern for humanity before he was Muslim. The Prophet had concern for humanity before he was a Prophet. Then after having this philosophical basis, then the next thing is, you really feel why people are poor, why people are suffering. Why is there injustice in the world? Not only you feel it, but you're willing to do something for it. Despite love for wealth, he gives to help humanity at the individual level. Then, now you do ibadah to further polish yourself, to clean yourself, so you can further. But if you have no concern for humanity, you have no concern of hurting other people's feelings. You have no empathy for other people. And you're doing ibadat. Those ibadat, they're, waste, waste, they're wasted. According to the Quran, not just in this place, but in other places. If your ibadat have not changed you, then what use are If you have no concern for humanity, the Prophet was a person like he would share a sandwich with a poor person. We look down upon the poor person. Oh, He's lazy. He smells bad. 
Then at the social level, everything is a contract. And they keep their promises whenever they make them. You, wife and husband is a contract. Employer and employee is a contract. These are all contracts you have in your social, in your muamalat. It's all contracts. But that's not enough. Feeling good for humanity is not enough. Doing ibadat is not enough. You have to then stand up for justice, stand up for the truth, fight for the truth. Tawasul bil haqi wa tawasul bil sabr. So wal mufuna bi ahdim ida ahadu wa sabirina fil baqsai wa darai wa hina al baqs. Then you have to stand up for truth. You have to stand up for justice. Those people who feel for humanity and then do ibadat, then they stand up for justice. Those are the people that are going to make a difference. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمُفُونَ بِأَحْدِمْ إِذَا عَحَدُوا وَالصَّابِرِينَ And those who are patient, فِي الْبَعْصَى In poverty, when they're struggling, وَالْدَرَاءَ In hardship, difficulty, وَحِينَ الْبَعْصَى And in the time of war, because it may come to that point, that when you're struggling for the truth, because then you have to stand up for the truth. They have patience. أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا These are the people that are truthful. These are the people that really mean business. These are the people who have taqwa of Allah. These are the people who really fear Allah. And then the other ayah. Again, I'm going to try to finish all five of the big ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. Number two is known as Ayatul Ayat. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accounts his ayat, his signs. So this is one thing. What is bir? What is righteousness? You can be an alim, but if you don't have the things in that ayah that I just mentioned, you're not a righteous person. You're not righteous. You're not righteous, you're not virtuous. If you don't have those qualities. Then, number two, theme of the Qur'an that we should leave Ramadan with. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And in the alteration of the day and the night. Allah created the earth. What a suitable place this is. Look at all the other planets around us. The whole universe. You know, there's a person, I forget his name, very, very, he's very famous. He used to have a program on universe, um, on PBS. He's a professor. He is an atheist for this very reason. The whole universe is not conducive to life. His point is, the life is life is not conducive in the whole universe except for Earth, and so it's by chance. But the same argument, the the, the, the data is correct. The conclusion is wrong. The whole universe is definitely not conducive to life. But the fact it is conducive on earth shows that maybe, not maybe, but there's definitely, there's a superpower. Because there's too many probabilities that go on to make this happen. So first, إِنَّا فِي خَلْكَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Indeed, in the creations of the highest skies and the earth. وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ In the alteration of the day and the night. In the daytime, you have a blue sky. You know why they have a blue screen on your computer? Because it's soft for your eyes. Imagine if we had a... A, a brown or red sky like Mars how, how much how, there would be in pain in our eyes from seeing that color green and blue the most soft colors to the human eye in the alteration of the day and the night perfectly set day and night in motion in such a way that you know uh, both in terms of weather because look at the planet like Mercury it goes too slow it gets too hot it, you have a full 24 hours in which you can actually function and rest, function and rest properly. And look at the ship, the big ships. Fulk is big ships. Safina, Safina is a small ship. The big ships that travel for everything that human beings get from this earth is a benefit. 
So we trade. You dig the earth, you get oil, minerals, copper, iron, so on and so forth. Which for whose benefit? It's all there by chance. Human being is on earth like he belongs on earth. It's not just, you know, because the earth is separate and the earth is separate. How did the two come together and totally suitable for each other? So, And then Allah reveals, sends down the rain. And then there's a whole system of the water cycle and the nitrogen and all these different cycles that are going on. that keep life going and progressing. And Allah put on earth every dab, every moving creature is on earth, no other planet. You might have bacteria there. But moving creatures are on earth. And in the changing of the air. And in the, in the clouds, that are controlled by Allah to move in a certain direction. Moving in different uh, heights as they go around the earth. And this are signs for people who have understanding, that they're willing to take understanding into their mind. Not in terms of intellect, but they are able to reflect and to be able to tie themselves to something. So Allah says, look at my creation, look at my world. So you know what's interesting about these two ayahs put together. There was a philosopher by the name of Kant. Kant. He wrote a book. And in this book he said, you can't prove God. You can't prove it. And then you know the Christians that were strong at that time in England, not like today, where there's no one going to churches in Europe. So there was an uproar. Why did you write this book against the philosopher. Then he wrote a book against his book. The name of the book I'm forgetting right now, it's called uh, Critique of Pure Reason. The name of the book is Critique of Pure Reason. He said, yeah, you can't prove God except for two things. The moral law within. Why you feel something is right? Why you feel something is wrong? Look, there is something there. And the starry skies above. If you look at the stars above, and if you look at the moral law within, yeah, there has to be a God. This is what Kant said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this are signs for people that take heed. Second ayah. Third ayah, well, we're, uh, I don't have too much time, so I'm, maybe I'm going to go over two more ayahs and then make my last statements, inshallah. This ayah is historic. The first ayah, Ayatul Bir, is the basis of Islamic ethics. The second ayah I read is the basis of, look at the signs of Allah. Our belief system. The basis of our belief system. The third ayah is historical. Whole humanity should be one. The whole humanity should be one community. Why are we divided? The Quranic response to this question. This is known as ayatul ikhtilaf. But I like to call it ayatul ikhtilafain because of two differences that come here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَانَ النَّاسِ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا You know, from Adam, humanity was one. There was no black, white, yellow, whatever, no. There was one religion, one humanity. I wish I can discuss on this ayah more, we don't have time. كَانَ النَّاسِ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَمْ I will go over this ayah quickly, I'm not going to go into the details I wanted. I did want to finish ayah al Qusi. I will not finish ayah al Dain today. But because I have some more things to say, inshallah, uh, about tonight and some more comments I wanted to make and then we will. And then at the end we'll also be doing some du'as, inshallah. Then Allah raised prophets amongst the people to give them uh, good tidings, 
you do good, good will happen. If you do bad, then there's a warning. وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ And Allah sent down the books. Why? لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ So then those books that were coming down early on, they were deciding the affairs between the people for what they differed. لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِيهُ فِي مَا اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ For the things that were differing in, the prophets came with books and said, okay, this is the end. But some people, they did, how did we become divided in the beginning of history? And then this is now continuing. وَمَا اخْتَلَفَ فِيهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ أُوتُهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ They didn't divide until the clear proofs came to them. And they divided, why? I'm just summarizing here. بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُ The urge to dominate. You know, Edler, the psychologist, he says, the most strongest urge, like Freud said, sex is the strongest urge. Edler said, the urge to dominate is the biggest human urge. Why we fight in the masjid? Why we have conflicts? Urge to dominate. <coughs> urge to dominate. Urge to dominate. And I'm wonderful. My opinions are wonderful. What I want is wonderful. I'm just wonderful. Baghiyam baynahu. Because... Because of baghi, me, I, me. Baghi and bainam, this then, they got, became divided. Allah says over and over again in Quran, people became divided after knowledge came to them. وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ They became divided after knowledge came to them. Before that is a different issue. But we became divided after knowledge came. Then Allah says, فَهَدَى اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا اخْتَلَفُوا فِي Then Allah guided humanity in the things that they differed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala s.a.w. says, وَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ There's nothing that you differ in except the hukum of it is with Allah. فَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ There's nothing that you differ in except the command of it of what to do is with Allah. I'm going to skip the rest of the ayah and go to ayat al-kursi and then I have some few comments to make. I'm sorry I will be taking longer today than usual but it is the last Friday of Ramadan and I want to make it significant. Ayat al-kursi. What is the message of ayat al-kursi? He is Allah. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayu al-qayyum. This part everybody understands. He is al-hayy, life comes from him. Al-qayyum, he is controlling the universe. But the main point is the authority belongs to Allah. Other people are playing God, pretending to be God. No! The kursi, the authority belongs to Allah. Then what Allah says, The truth is clear from falsehood. Who is Tahud? Tahud are those that, that play God. You have to reject those who play God or pretend to God, then come to Allah. You know you have the Kaaba and the idols around the Kaaba, you have to throw away the idols first, then go to the Kaaba. So here, just I don't have the time to go over all the different themes. But again, Quran, Lawh al Mahfud. Balhuwa Quran al Majid fi Lawh al Mahfud. And from Lawh al Mahfud, your destinies come on Laylatul Qadr. Why? So that Allah will see in the beginning of this month how your attitude was with Quran. Then in the mirror of Quran, your destinies will be decided. In Allah Yarfa'u bihadhi aqwaman wa yadahu bihi akhareen. The Prophet said, Allah will raise nations because of this Quran. And Allah will throw down nations because of this Quran. Quran has, as I demonstrated to you in the short amount of time we have. Beautiful themes like this. Beautiful themes of ethics, of the, the principles on which we can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He really does exist. The principles of what is justice and not justice. How human, history from the Quranic perspective. And we, we just wrap the Quran and put it up. Then what will happen on Laylatul Qadr? Because the center of Lahul Mahfuz is Ummul Kitab, the Quran. The mirror by which your destinies will be decided. So, anyway, I'm not trying to yell. 
I'm just trying to educate. So, I did want to uh, mention two things uh, before we finish. Number one, this Ramadan, I saw a lot of people, meaning the community was here. I did notice, and I want everybody to think about this for themselves. You know, people talk in the corners, but slowly somebody says something to me in my ears. And then some people are sitting in one corner, and then slowly coming from one person to another, it comes to my ears. So sometimes I know, maybe not everything, but whatever Allah wills comes to my ears. Right? Whatever Allah wills comes to my ears. And I hear what goes on. And I have to say, we sometimes as a community act to use a light word, a little childish. I will say this. Let's not have su'adhan. You know, the, the Jews, they talk about this problem amongst themselves. It's called uh, self-hate. The Jews, they hate themselves. They're hate, they like others. You know, the Quran says, be stern and hard with the disbelievers and nice amongst yourself. Now I'm not saying that because we're not in that situation necessarily that you be stern on the disbelievers. But at least be merciful amongst the Muslims. We have everything that happens. We think the worst situation must be true. And we talk like the worst situation must be true. Why? Why can't we trust one another? Is it because we're not used to living in extended families anymore? We don't know what it means to have brothers and sisters and to fight with brothers and sisters? What's going on? What's going on? For the one month, I mean, I was thinking many times doing ibadah in Tarawi that, you know, I'm here standing with people that are also standing. We're doing ibadah, but in our minds, all this filth goes on. Suwazan. We have evil thoughts about people. Why? What type of ibadah is this? So, think about it. I mean, think inside yourself. Everybody thinks, you know, everybody thinks I'm great. Everyone thinks I'm great. The other issue that I wanted to touch upon is the issue of hijama, which Brother Imam Rochelle touched upon. There is a sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. I won't go into the details. I'm going to admit because time is now run out. This is such an important sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that you know in Miraj when he went for the five time prayers, when he got the gift of the five time prayers. One of the things that was commanded to the Prophet in addition to the prayers is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet hijama upon the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. To do hijama, to do bloodletting, to let out the blood. Now, I know in the Desi community this is not popular, but amongst the Arabs, the Arab Muslim brothers, they know this sunnah very well. Because I have seen in my experience that sometimes some sunnahs are done more in one culture and done less in another culture. It doesn't make one culture or the other culture is not the important part. But Allah had, it, had a way of preserving His sunnah. Some people adapted one sunnah, another people adapted another sunnah. Just like there's Hanafi in one place, there's Shafi in another place, two different sunnahs are being protected sometimes. Sometimes it's not like that, but sometimes it is like that. My point is that hijama is bloodletting. Now, somebody sees blood somewhere and then freaks out, I can understand that. Trust me, I can. That's okay. But then what happens after that and how it becomes into what it became, that's a little bit sad. You know, if there's an issue, a religious issue, you have a religious question, come to me. Come to me if you have a religious question. If you have an administrative question, go to Dr. Rehan. You have a religious question, come to me. Maybe I can solve it for you. But it's not fair to do what we do, to talk behind people's backs, right? To backbite other people, to slander other people. For what? Who, you're, not hurting, you're not hurting anyone except yourself on the Day of Judgment. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> so anyway, think about it. And we still have time for istighfar and transforming ourselves. And uh, inshallah, uh, I do want to tell you that uh, brother, Imar, brother Imran, his father is in the hospital right now. So please do make dua, inshallah we'll make special dua after the prayers also. Um, I wanted to share one thing with you, but I don't think I have time, maybe I do. I wanted to bring this to tie everything up together uh, on a more positive note. Inshallah, I'll just mention one thing. Um, this is about willpower. This book is on willpower. 
and uh, just wanted to share one thing with you. It says, amongst the many studies he's going on, other studies have found that committing to anything small, like salah, you commit, I'll pray five times a day. How does it improve you? Committing to anything small, consistent act of self-control, whatever it is, will do what? Can increase your overall willpower. And then he goes into the different studies that show this. Islam gives you structure. Why? Fast. Why? Salah. Why? This is bayinati min al huda. That second part of Quran. The, one is the guidance, but one is the wisdom of guidance. You see, Hajj. Hajj doesn't tell you. Hajj doesn't say to you, this is to show equality of humanity and to show United Nations of the Muslims. We're all Muslims. This is the real United Nations. Where five million people from different parts of the world are coming together. The Quran doesn't tell you, or Sunnah doesn't tell you. You extrapolate from the concrete, from the act. Oh, this is the wisdom of this. So, Quran wants us to have a strong willpower. And because it has commands, because Quran has commands, therefore it has to help you build these, this willpower to enact those commands. So, you take anything five times. So, I'm saying leave this Ramadan. If you used to come here every day, come at least every week. If you, if you came here once a month, if you used to come here only Saturday, Sundays, come here at least, you know, once a month. Make some commitment. Make a commitment and have a goal. Nothing can ever be achieved if you don't have a goal. You have to make a commitment and have a goal. Okay, I will do this. And you have to see a future self. You have to see yourself doing something in the future. And you have to commit to it to be able to make that change. It shouldn't be that, okay, I know Ramadan, in the future yourself, you see of yourself, is not becoming better after Ramadan. It's like going back to default. If you go back to, oh, I'm going to go back to play, then your future self is not, if you're, you know when a person's really changing? When the future self they see is different. When you're in college, you see yourself graduating and applying for jobs. If you don't see a future self that's different from your now, you're not going to change. Sorry. Anyway, so may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, give shifa to Brother Imran's father. Allahumma taj al Qur'an rabiya kulubina wa nura suburina. Allahumma gfil lana, Allahumma taj al khilafat al muslimin fi hadhi al ard. Allahumma gfil lana wa hamna, Allahumma inna ka afuun tuhibu la fa fafu anna. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayt ala Ibrahim. وعلى آل إبراهيم إن حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إن حميد مجيد آمين يا رب العالمين. Just two announcements more. We'll make du'a for Brother Imran Shofat's father. But today after the Rawi prayer, I'm going to go over Surah Rahman, Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Al-Waqia, and Surah Yasin. If I can, I will try to finish the just a fast pace. Fast, not tafsir, fast pace, but showing you the connections of the verses of the Quran of these surahs. And then on Saturday, I'll choose something from the 30th juz. Number one. Number two, after Jummah, we have a question and answer session for the sisters. Uh, me and Imam Rochelle will be here to answer any questions you have. Uh, وَيَنْحَى أَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيَ يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ يَذْكُرْكُمْ فَاسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ فَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ